There's no question that UFOs are real. I studied the UFO phenomenon all over the world in 42 countries. I traveled a million kilometers for it. And there's no question that indeed there's something behind the UFO phenomenon which is real and indicating an extraterrestrial presence here on Earth. I don't believe in UFOs. I've seen a number of them, and so I'm quite certain they exist. And it's a bit like asking, do you believe in this chair I'm sitting in? Well, I mean, it's there and you can see it. I've seen them. I've seen a tremendous evidence associated with them. And there's no question in my mind that they are real. Uh, I personally don't think that's true because there have been committee after committee consisting of, of you know, top flight academics and people who are skilled in, in, in recognizing aerial phenomena and so forth. When they look at the evidence, what they find is that you know, the UFOs turn out to be natural phenomena. The idea that unidentified objects in the skies may be spacecraft from another world sharply divides skeptics from believers. But it's an idea that is growing in popularity worldwide. Unidentified flying objects have been seen in the sky since the beginning of time. But are they mere quirks of nature or something more profound? And if so, what? In 1947, it was claimed that an alien spacecraft crashed in the desert near the town of Roswell, New Mexico. And indeed, although they later retracted this statement, initially the American military seemed to confirm the fact. Two weeks earlier, Kenneth Arnold, a private pilot, had reported seeing disc-shaped craft in the skies ahead of him near Mount Rainier in Washington State. These two incidents triggered a belief in a phenomenon that over the last 50 years has attracted followers from all walks of life. Dr. Stephen Greer, a qualified medical doctor, is certain that UFOs are both real and extraterrestrial. He thinks he has plenty of evidence to justify a congressional hearing on the subject. Uh, there's more evidence for this subject than there, are, there, there is for black holes. We have over 3,500 uh, pilot reports from a member of my team who's collected them from civilian and military people. We have uh, 4,000 landing trace events. We have hundreds of photographs that are daylight, crystal clear, they've been analyzed, and they're not hoaxes. So far, Greer's efforts to persuade Congress have been unsuccessful. But his organization continues to groom its followers for contact with E.T. So CSETI has also instituted a program of going around the world and initiating teams of observers, but beyond that, teams of people capable of interacting with these objects and with the intelligence behind these objects, which is what's really important. There's been a combination of tremendous security put around the subject, which we're familiar with, and public disinformation and ridicule, which makes the subject the laughing stock of, of the scientific community and others. And so uh, I may go and meet with a deputy director of NASA, and they're extremely interested, and they know the subject is real. But they would never go and be in front of a camera talking about it, because it'd be the end of their careers professionally. Here we have the most commonly observed type of UFO. It's an official USF picture. And this is the disc-shaped UFO with a dome on top. There's no doubt that the UFO phenomenon attracts more than its share of ridicule. But are photographs, however dubious, and individual eyewitness accounts too readily dismissed by skeptics? We, healthy, normal human beings, we are able to describe something we have seen accurately and we are not the victims of delusions all the time. We can be, but we are not always. Denying the reality of your voice means denying the value of the human testimony itself. Close to a crop circle area in Alton Bounds, and we have one of these little balls of light flying the local UFO clubs that Michael Hessman addresses are part of a growing international circuit. And you see 
By far the majority here are convinced that UFOs are real and extraterrestrial in origin. Is it such an impossible idea? It is not impossible at all for people to believe that we could be visited by other civilizations because we ourselves send UFOs to other planetary bodies so if there was life on some other planet they may have also done the same thing by sending things to uh, other uh, planetary bodies. That there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe is no longer doubted by many of today's scientists and astronauts like Ulrich Volta. I'm convinced that in our universe there are other intelligence. However, I don't think that's true within our galaxy, in our Milky Way. Astronaut Story Musgrave is even more convinced. Statistically, it's a certainty. There are hugely advanced civilizations, intelligences, life forms out there. I believe they're so advanced that they're even doing interstellar travel. I believe it's possible they came here. The ultimate question is, is someone else out there? And if they're out there, how many of them are there? And are they visiting us? We don't know, and we want to know. What is it about the UFO phenomenon that makes it so difficult to pin down, despite reports of sightings from all over the world? Primarily, it's the nature of the evidence. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. High in the mountains of Chile, Jorge Ibarra, a gold miner, says he had a close encounter with a UFO. I saw one light, the big light. It stopped over my head, about 300 meters high. It has a blue light, completely blue light now. In this moment, the UFO cut the blue light and give it three types of light, yellow, green, and red. They came in direct for me, saying I receive one special energy force on my body. But something curious, the UFO has no noise of the motor, only as a wind. Same when you have a stick, a big stick, and make this way, and the UFO moving again. Like so many UFO accounts, Jorge Ibarra's story, lacking as it is in tangible evidence, rests solely on the reliability of one individual's testimony. In Belgium in 1989 and 90, it was a very different story. Here there was a UFO phenomenon that engaged the whole country to the highest level. Literally hundreds of separate sightings of a strange triangle of lights that moved slowly across the countryside were reported to the authorities. And this unidentified flying object was investigated by a number of experts. At first sight, uh, it is very strange. Because, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, technical, uh, the technical characteristics of such uh, flying objects are uh, very different from what we know. Un engin. Professor Leon Brennig teaches at the Free Un University of Brussels uh, and was one of those who looked closely at the phenomenon. I saw a lot of first-hand witnesses had direct access to at least 800 investigations which were carefully made. All these investigations indicate that there is really a phenomenon which is unusual or the flying characteristics are highly strange. We have a lot of observations of such triangular platform uh, which was hovering silently without any uh, action, apparent action on the air above a farm during uh, 20 minutes. Why above a farm? What does it mean? One of
of the many witnesses at the time was Colonel André Armand, a civil engineering officer in the Belgian army. In December 1989, he was driving along this road at night when he saw three rectangular panels of light moving slowly across the sky. I saw the yellow panels beyond the trees there, flying till the trees there. And the yellow panels change into a white light and uh, this white light uh, was coming down to me. At, at this moment my wife uh, told to me, André, come, we, we must go now. Uh, because when you see such big uh, light coming to you, that's very strange to see that. And my wife said to me, André, we are going away now. This light disappears and I saw only three yellow, white, smaller lights, triangular. The center, the red uh, light, pulsing, always pulsing. And this uh, object uh, was flying away very, very fast in uh, this direction. In the following months, there were many similar sightings of a strange triangle of lights, not only in the countryside, but also hovering over the rooftops in the centre of Brussels. Marcel Alferano, a shopkeeper, managed to capture it on his camcorder. There were two fires, two big fires in front. It happened at 2h, 2h20 in the morning, the night of the 30th or 31st. It happened at about 2.20 in the morning on the night of the 30th, 31st of March. Uh, I took my camera and I went upstairs. It was at that moment that I saw in the distance two lights. They were bigger than car headlights and they were slowly coming towards me. They were moving very slowly, high above the rooftops there. And as they got closer, I could see there was a third light behind the other two. They stopped over there. I realized it was not a plane. It was something bizarre, something unrecognizable. Later, some people from the government phoned me and they say I should not get too carried away. They said I should say it was a plane I had filmed. The Belgian Air Force decided that whatever the UFO was, it could not be ignored. In uh, 89, 90, we had a lot of uh, observation from the ground, a lot of people seeing uh, strange things in the air, and the Belgian Air Force already scrambled two times F-16 to observe uh, what the people saw from the ground. Wilfred de Brouwer, a colonel at the time, was officer in charge of operations. Some people saw very strange uh, objects in the air uh, with a very peculiar behavior. Uh, they called the police. Uh, the police confirmed uh, the observation. They called the radar station of Glon. And Glon uh, confirmed that they saw a blip in the area. And that was also confirmed by another radar station, which is about 100 miles away. Based on that, they asked to send these two aircraft in the air. That night we had a scramble with two F-16. I was one of one of the two pilots, so I was leading the pair for that uh, that mission. We had a lot of information coming from the ground, and those people could basically uh, inform us about the exact position of the, I would say, the UFO. The ground radar observed a blip which was moving very fast from an area south of Brussels towards the east. Uh, 
uh, the aircraft were in the near vicinity and uh, of course tried to detect that particular uh, object and uh, the two aircraft uh, confirmed that they had a lock-on uh, which showed the speed of uh, 700 knots, around 700 knots. The F-16s had repeated locks on to the UFO, but as they closed in, it changed direction and speed with extraordinary maneuverability. The pilots had no doubt that the target was real. We had a different radar contact on the target, so it happens uh, at least three, four times where we could acquire a radar lock-on with the F-16, and we knew that at least one or two times we had exactly the same contact as the one which was on the screen on the ground. It was accelerating uh, very fast, so it was going from uh, 50 knots to more than uh, 1,000 knots. It was really climbing and descending very fast, and it was changing, heading abruptly. And most of the time, it was even flying supersonic. The Air Force never did make direct visual contact with the UFO. Exactly what the target was remained a mystery. I don't think it could have been experimental aircraft. Uh, first of all, we always look to the United States. They could have been doing experiments here. I, I don't see why they should be doing it in Belgium in the first place. Secondly, they confirmed officially that it was not them. We had an official declaration of the ambassador here. And uh, thirdly, uh, the performance of this system was such that it could not be related even to an experimental technology. It was not a prototype, and I don't really believe it was a meteorological phenomenon at that, that moment. There's not much left, and well, one could uh, refer to an uh, extraterrestrial uh, observation or vehicle, if you want. And I think that's an, an option which, or an assumption, which should not be excluded. I'm not saying that it was an extraterrestrial, but it is an assumption that should not be excluded. The radar tape from one of the F-16s was sent for detailed examination by experts at the Center for the Study of Electronic Warfare. The radar specialist who advised the investigating team there was Professor Emil Schweitzer, a distinguished physicist who teaches at the country's elite military academy. What did he make of the strange unidentified craft that the Belgian Air Force tried to intercept? That UFO could, could make right turns, which is impossible uh, by our laws of uh, mechanics, and that that UFO could uh, also change very suddenly the velocity, which is also impossible, but it be, because it would give uh, an infinite acceleration. Is it possible that the Air Force's unseen UFO was nothing more than a technical aberration in the radar equipment? I don't think that you can explain it by saying that all radars made the same mistake. That's highly unlikely. There are different types of radar, there are different types of antennas, and also the orientation of the target was different for uh, the, the four radars. I'm going to be fired by my colleagues, but I think that extraterrestrial intelligence is very highly likely. A photograph of the Belgian Triangle of Lights was later computer enhanced. The image that was revealed appears to show a dark, delta-shaped craft behind the lights. As more and more people worldwide look to the skies, so more and more UFO sightings are reported. And increasingly, an extraterrestrial interpretation is capturing the popular imagination. Mass communications have spread details of sightings around the globe, revealing, among other things, that there are recurring similarities between some UFOs of today and those of the past. This footage was taken near a military base in Montana in 1957. 
but I saw two silvery objects moving swiftly out of the northwest. The objects were very bright and about 10,000 feet in the air. They appeared to be of a bright, shiny metal, like polished silver. Both were the same size and were traveling at the same rate of speed, which was much slower than the jets which shot by shortly after I filmed the discs. In Germany, more than 30 years later, strange balls of light were again seen in the sky. But this time they were stationary and both witnessed and photographed by hundreds of people. It happened at Greifswald on the Baltic Sea. Valery Vinogradov was one of those who had his video camera to hand and he recorded what he saw that night. Da, da reden Leute etwas über UFOs, also das was also da Interessantes muss sein. I heard noises, so I went into the kitchen. I looked out of the window. I could hear excited voices in the street and everyone was pointing towards the sky. And then I saw these glowing balls hanging in a sort of formation in the sky. It was in this direction, over Greifswald nuclear power station, towards the town of Lubin. Within the formation, the spheres all seemed to be rotating, but it was as if they were acting together in a formation, and the whole group was hovering, not making any sudden moves. It was just hovering in a stable kind of way. Then I saw a small sphere come in from the right. It looked as if it flew right into the group and dissolved. I think it's proof that, whatever they were, they were not flares. So far, pictures on their own have done little to solve the mystery of what UFOs are. While it's true that still photographs, moving film and more recently home videos have produced an intriguing record of sightings over the past 50 years, imagery alone has failed to reveal much about the true nature of the objects we are seeing. The inevitable distant, handheld, out-of-focus pictures say little or nothing of the UFO's internal mechanism, if indeed they have one. If we say, how would an alien phenomena look, then we don't have a clue. It might look like a UFO. It might look like an ordinary airplane because they're disguised. It might be totally invisible. We could look out there, out there and there could be an alien spacecraft hanging over the city of Houston. It's possible, but we're looking for evidence to prove it's so. It seems there is no stereotype for UFOs. Cigar-shaped, bowl-shaped and saucer-shaped craft are the most common manifestations of the phenomenon. Whatever they are, UFOs by definition display characteristics that are clearly different from any known conventional craft. And that is about as much as can be deduced from visual images. On the odd occasion when UFOs are sharply photographed and the image clearly discernible, it raises other problems. In 1971, on holiday on the borders of Austria and Germany, a musician and his wife were enjoying the landscape when they witnessed something very unusual. Rudy Nagora recalls what happened. I heard a whistling tone that was coming from somewhere nearby. I thought somebody was playing with the radio in their car, but it wasn't the case. Then I could hear that the sound was coming from above. I looked up and in the sky I suddenly saw a round moving object. It certainly didn't move like an aeroplane. A plane might do loops. But it doesn't suddenly stop and stand still. A helicopter could suddenly stop, but you would be able to see the movement of the rotor blades. And there were none. It stood still in the air and made a humming noise. It wasn't in one spot all the time. It would suddenly be behind me. So I had to keep turning around. But in the end I managed to take 12 pictures. Of course they were ridiculed a lot, I doubt it. People said I had seen a hubcap and such like. Until they were analyzed.
Budinagora's pictures were independently examined in Germany and America, and no evidence of any trick photography was discovered. But are they evidence of an extraterrestrial craft? A close encounter through the camera lens is not proof enough. Mexico, there have been more UFO sightings in the last five years than anywhere else in the world. In 1994, the hills of Guadalajara were the setting for a close encounter of the second kind. That is to say, the UFO was not only seen at close hand, but there was some interaction between it and the man who photographed it. Raul Dominguez is a landowner and a businessman. He recalls the extraordinary craft he saw that day. It was a machine that I believe was about 25 meters in diameter. The lower half revolved. I didn't notice any noise until it was very close to me. I heard it when it was 10 or 12 meters above my head. And I heard a sound like bees buzzing. I felt my hair bristling, and my clothes moved, as well as my hair. Immediately afterwards, these marks appeared on my face and hands. I was ill with stomach pains and bad indigestion for a long time. The whole thing affected me very much, both physically and psychologically. It has changed me. I'm certain now that UFOs exist. Pictures of what may or may not be spacecraft from another world are only as real as the integrity of the witnesses who take them. And an extraterrestrial interpretation assumes the possibility that we could be visited by aliens in the first place. The main argument against this are the vast distances involved in space. The nerve center for those scientists who believe that far out in the cosmos is the only place we'll find E.T. is here at Arecibo in Puerto Rico. The largest radio telescope in the world is at the disposal of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I really do think that the aliens are out there. I don't think they're here. Uh, the reason for that is simply the lack of credible evidence, in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's very hard to travel from one star to the next, despite what you see in the movies and on television. It's not just a matter of calling up the engine room and telling Scotty to put the pedal to the metal. SETI was originally funded by NASA, and they've searched for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence for more than 20 years. The space agency no longer invests in their experiment, and there are those who argue it's because NASA already knows that ET is here. It's a view that SETI's astronomers reject out of hand. They're convinced that the first contact with ET will be a radio signal that shows up on this screen. Yeah, people often ask, have you, have you had any uh, close calls? Are you, are you close to success? And well, that, that isn't the way this works. It's kind of what you might call a one-bit experiment. In other words, uh, it's either yes or no. And so far, the answer is no. It's sort of like Chris Columbus, you know, uh, until he sights land, all he's seen is water. And, and that's our situation. If he in there. <laughs> so far, all signals received have turned out to be false alarms. So is it worth continuing the search? The question of whether anybody else is out there is the oldest unanswered question that our species has ever asked. And personally, I wouldn't work on a project that I didn't think had a chance of success. Well, I certainly believe that the, uh, the aliens are out there. I mean, I have personally no, no doubt about that. Uh, obviously, there's no proof. In my opinion, there's no proof of that yet. But the, the reason that I think that it's got to be true is primarily just the vastness of the cosmos. I mean, there are half trillion stars in our galaxy. There are 50 billion other galaxies, each with a half trillion stars. That's a lot of real estate. And it would be 
bizarre in the extreme to think that this is the only bit of real estate where anything interesting is happening. The founding father of SETI, Professor Frank Drake, devised an equation that estimates the universe to be teeming with intelligent life. So if ET is out there and could have reached us, then surely those who deal with space travel are most likely to have seen some signs. Dr. Farouk El-Baz, a geologist, now works at Boston University. For six years, he was a senior member of NASA's legendary Apollo program. He was head of astronaut training and responsible for the intricate experiments that were scheduled for testing on the moon's surface. During his time in mission control, he experienced at first hand some unusual happenings involving astronaut Ken Mattingly in the lunar orbiter. The one most peculiar sighting of something that we never found out what it was and we thought it should be easy to, was the sighting of flashes on the surface of the moon by Ken Mattingly during the Apollo 16 mission. One of the objectives of that Apollo 16 mission was to see how much can we see and photograph in the part of the moon that is not lit by the sun, but by earth shine. The first time Ken Mattingly began to do this, he said something like, I'll be damned, I just saw a flash. And we said, what flash? So he said, I just saw a light flash on the surface of the moon, something on the moon, flashed. As he came around the next time and we said, now be careful with this thing and look again and uh, mark your time when you see it so we know exactly when it happens because we want to tie this to whatever is happening in the landing site. One of NASA's experiments on the moon involved highly sensitive seismometers that among other things could detect the impact of incoming meteors. If Mattingly's flashes appeared again, the instruments would surely record the impact of a meteor, the most likely explanation for his sighting. And so, on the next lunar orbit, Ken Mattingly was briefed to look out for flashes and report what he saw. He said, okay. And he did that, and he saw two flashes. This time, and that one orbit, not one. So we picked, picked up the exact times, and we took these to our colleagues, the ones that had the seismometers. But at that time, there was absolutely no evidence of anything hitting the moon at these hours because it would have been picked up for it. There is absolutely no explanation. And that remained a complete mystery. Of course, at this time, the Russians had an unmanned presence on the moon. Nevertheless, there are unexplained pictures. This one shows a shadow racing across the moon's surface. And here, a flash appears from a crater as an unidentified object passes overhead. Hey, there's a funny object right there. And the astronaut's going to pan around here. Notice the moon never goes out of sight. There it is again, and the object, it's changed. Dr. Jack Kasher has studied this film and is convinced that it shows a UFO on the moon. The Earth. The moon was in Head of physics at Nebraska University, Dr. Kasher's academic background is impressive. I studied the physics of the effects of nuclear weapons, among other things. I specialized in electromagnetic theory, electromagnetic pulses, did some work on the Star Wars program out there. In 1991, I started doing research with NASA. Uh, my clearance was up to the secret restricted data. In fact, one paper that I wrote was so classified that I couldn't read it myself, but I had to get special permission to, to read it. Three main engines up and burning. Three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of the space shuttle Discovery and the upper atmosphere research satellite. We've been in a new era of studying the Earth's environment from space. Dr. Kasher has studied closely another film taken in space during shuttle mission STS-48. He's certain that here there is irrefutable proof that there are UFOs in space and NASA must know it. 
After a flash, an object seems to move rapidly away from an approaching missile. NASA sees it differently. Four NASA scientists looked at these objects, and there will be another one right here, and decided that they were probably ice particles close to the shuttle that were being blown by the attitude adjuster rockets that uh, go off to adjust the shuttle's orientation. It's a fact that the shuttle's jets do blow ice particles around in space, a story Musgrave knows well. If you just shut the engines down, there's thousands of particles which come forward for some reason. You see this marvelous debris come across the front windows. My analysis leads me otherwise. I have concluded that these are probably spacecraft out in space away from the shuttle. We'll see the main object appear here soon. There it is. It's going to go up here, and there will be a double flash down here. Apparently, in response to that, it'll cut back very sharply in that direction, and then you'll see a streak go through where the object had been. Watch for the double flash. There's the flash. There it goes, and there goes the streak right through where it had been. I think they're spacecraft because uh, they change direction, apparently in response to the flashes. And so they're maneuvering, they're accelerating, changing directions out in space, and that's my definition of spacecraft. I'm uh, convinced that this is snowflakes, small so snowflakes illuminated by the sun. There was one snowflake mean doing a 90 degrees turn. I don't understand why this snowflake makes such a kind of turn. It could be that it collides with something else so it makes th a different direction. These two objects reacted to... I've seen the report by Dr. Kasher. I've heard his presentations. He has the timing of the flashes wrong. He has the position of the, of the jets and the pulses wrong. The timing of the flashes occurred at a certain time. I tried to tell him several years ago about the fact that the visible flash on the television does not fully coincide with the actual rocket pulse. Uh, and I have a letter I sent him. He disregarded that. I think that, that NASA would tend to be quiet about anything that, that would tend to have an extraterrestrial interpretation. I think it's like the rest of the branches of the government. I think there's a cover-up and uh, they are keeping things concerning UFOs from us. Three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia on a life sciences mission for Earth and space. The fact is, there are unidentified flying objects in space and even on the way there. This one appeared in the middle of a shuttle launch. On another occasion, on mission STS-73, astronaut Caddy Coleman is heard to announce loud and clear that she's just seen a UFO. We have an unidentified flying object. Is there something going on in space that we're not being told? The Americans are not the only ones in space. The Mir space station has allowed Russian cosmonauts to break the records for the length of time spent in space. During a docking with Mir, cosmonaut Musa Manorov filmed an unidentified object that passed by. At some point in the filming, I caught sight of something that seemed to have separated from the ship. Moreover, it was rotating as it moved away and changing its brightness. I can't say exactly how far away it was. I can only say it was not very close, because the camera was focused on infinity. At first it seemed to me that something has separated from the ship. But then, when I examined the ship, I realized that there was nothing that could have broken away. What's more, there were no alarms going off. Everything was calm. Later, there were lengthy arguments as to what it could possibly have been. On another mission, Russian cosmonaut Gennady Strikolov is certain he saw a most unusual unidentified flying object in space. It was a huge sphere. I think it appeared when we were over Newfoundland. The sea was in the background. It was shining, sparkling, of absolutely even shape. It shone like the balls that hang on trees at Christmas, greenish in color and all shimmering. It was impossible to take your eyes off it. I watched it for maybe five or seven seconds, but I didn't have a camera, and if I'd gone to get one, I would have lost it. 
for just as suddenly as it appeared, so it just disappeared. It's not difficult to misinterpret objects in space. This mysteriously floating sphere is actually a recently developed remote camera called AirCam. Story Musgrave is uniquely placed to know if there are UFOs in space. He spent 30 years with NASA and been on six missions. Has he seen anything in his time out there that might be evidence of extraterrestrial life or perhaps explain the UFO phenomenon? Nothing that I have seen personally has the signature, has those characteristics which you would attribute to uh, other forms of intelligence or other kinds of craft. Twice I saw what I call my eel, which uh, I don't know the size of it because I don't know how far away it was, but it was like a rubber piece of hose which had internal motions in it. Maybe it's eight feet, maybe it's ten, I'm not sure. When you can't tell how far away, you can't get a size. So I'm missing both of those things, size and how far away. But there's no question it had internal motion. Story Musgrave is open to the idea of alien civilizations, but is adamant that he has never found any proof on any of his shuttle missions. The new frontiers of space are providing pictures that serve only to fuel the UFO controversy. In this footage taken from shuttle mission STS-80, the camera's pointing back at Earth. There are many features that are known here flashes of lightning from tropical thunderstorms, the city lights of Denver, Colorado, meteors, satellites, and some 8,000 pieces of space debris. But still, there are some objects that remain a mystery, like this strange shape that appears unexpectedly from the Earth's atmosphere. Is it a UFO? What do the experts make of it? I don't know what it is. Whether it's a washer, debris, ice particle, I don't know. But it's characteristic of the thousands of things which I've seen. What is not quite so characteristic, it appears to come from nowhere. You would think that even if it's facing the dark side or facing a side toward you which does not reflect the sun, you think you would see something there. That, that one is really impressive. My first understanding that what you see was a reflection of a rising moon in the window for which the camera is looking. This was my first impression. But on the second thought, I thought that would be wrong. You know, there usually in life there are some possibilities which you don't think of. I don't know. My best guess from my scientific point of view is that we really are being visited by extraterrestrials probably have been for some time and I believe that at least some of these UFO reports are genuine and by UFO I really don't mean unidentified flying object I mean extraterrestrial spacecraft I think the word has evolved into meaning that and I think there are enough examples from enough reliable witnesses to suggest that this cries out for investigation. Clearly Dr. Kasher and other UFO believers think they have proof that NASA is keeping something secret. Let them put their analysis in some peer-reviewed journals or professional journals or a general interest publication, but I haven't seen any of it. We're not hiding anything. We don't have the uh, UFOs, spacecraft, and the beings stuffed in some uh, hangar on one of our centers. There would be no reason for us to do that. We, one of our goals is to find the origins and the search for life. If we find life, if we think we've been visited by life, we are going to trumpet it loudly. Our budget's been going down for the last five years. If there's one thing that could turn it around, it's some clear indication that life has either come here or we have found it somewhere else. We're not about to cover that up. 
A distinguished astronaut who agrees with Jack Cash's belief in the reality of UFOs is Gordon Cooper. Now in his 80s, in 1951, Cooper had a sighting while serving as a fighter pilot in Germany. Well, a weatherman had reported seeing these objects in the sky, and various other people got binoculars and looked for them, saw them also, and they were flying formations similar to our fighter formations, and we proceeded to launch some airplanes, see if we could get up where they were, and we could not, and gave up on it. They were higher and faster than we could go. They were very uh, metallic looking, symmetrical saucer shape. I think I saw some craft coming from some distant planet. Gordon Cooper was so convinced that there was evidence of UFOs here on Earth that in 1978 he went to the United Nations and presented them with a letter describing his experience. Today, Cooper is unswerving in his belief that UFOs are real. He's convinced that the evidence is not in space, but here on Earth, and no one knows it better than fellow pilots. And I do know a few airline pilots who've had some very real sightings, and I would suspect that there are probably vehicles that are coming from some other galaxy somewhere.